grief actually yes. um it's actually it, it it hurts to let go of the stories that we've been told about what makes sense as a as a life path and to accept yes. that the stories that we were raised in most of us are don't lead where they said they were going to lead <laughs> they don't they don't lead to star trek um they lead to the annihilation of life on earth and the space between stories is one of the most awkward and painful places because you don't have anything to make sense of life with yeah you know okay i'm 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 living in a dying world and it's actually it's the same dying world I lived in yesterday, but today I see it for what it is. And then the question of what now somehow is, is, is actually lighter and freer because before I was spending so much energy on denying my actual predictions on what was unfolding, my actual beliefs about what was happening. And I kept, no, we must keep hope. You know, we must stay positive. We must... But I didn't really believe it. And so it was exhausting to continually be, you know, trying to find hope. So when I could actually accept, okay, I don't think I can change this. I think, you know, we're headed into a collapse scenario. We're headed into um, what David calls the climacteric, this, you know, coming together of all these intertwined crises. Once you step beyond that threshold and actually accept that, actually a huge amount of energy is liberated yes huge amount of energy and that that hope beyond hope is actually stronger than the original hope because it's no longer really attached to outcomes it's just about telling a story with our lives that we're proud to tell in the context that we find ourselves and you know the the kind of the default hope the the must stay positive hope it's kind of fragile because it's constantly being threatened by information that maybe maybe our hope is misplaced Yes. But that hope beyond hope, there's nothing can challenge it. Like, you know, no matter what kind of future we face, no matter how wrong I inevitably am about how the future is going to unfold, I want to tell a story with my life that I'm deeply proud to tell. Mm -hmm. And nothing can make me doubt that. And so, yeah, so then I, I started to, you know, find a peer group, basically, um, which felt like kind of finding an oasis in the desert. And, and to anyone else who's, you know, in a similar place of feeling sort of alone with the apocalypse, like I would say, you know, that's the key thing is find the peer group, like find other people who care. Like, I mean, now they're like resilience.org is a great website, like go on resilience.org, start chatting to people, find out who's local to you. Like, but whatever your interests are, like, don't be just sitting there with the internet <laughs> yes, yes. because it's, it just is so hard and not conducive to the kind of, um, yeah, the kind of interactions. I mean, there's a wonderful line from David's work, actually. He says, um, do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation. Wow. Do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation. Wow. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I want to say, Sean, that, that you, um, you're making available David's work in such a compelling way um, and in such a accessible way has been huge for many of us. And so I just want to acknowledge, in addition to your own work uh, on dark optimism and sort of your own contributions, the fact that you have uh, so faithfully and powerfully uh, furthered David's legacy is just really huge. Um, I mean, um, honestly, it still, it feels, it feels like the best thing I've done. What, what's up for you now? Like, what you so give us a little sense of your work um, and then also what you're uh, particularly concerned about or passionate about uh, at this time. Hmm. Uh, well, in terms of my work to date, um, so you mentioned it kind of goes under this banner of, of dark optimism. Um, I was involved in the early days of the Transition Towns movement, uh, wrote the second book of that movement, um, chaired a, an organization called the Ecological Land Cooperative, which is um, basically helping people to access land for ecological projects and get through the, the planning permission system and the, and the financial difficulty of accessing land. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we've talked about David Fleming's work. I mean, he was a great friend and mentor of mine. Um, recently quite involved with the Extinction Rebellion over here in England, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the earliest arrestees as part of that movement. <laughs> um, 
got a film coming out uh, in a few months called um, called the sequel what will follow our troubled civilization uh, which is in many ways a kind of introduction to David Fleming's work for uh, people who maybe haven't encountered it through the books um, as yet uh, yeah I think those are my headline things and uh, at the moment I actually just just the other day published a uh, a blog post called um, Humanity, Not Just a Virus with Shoes, um, <laughs> which, uh, which is getting quite a lot of reaction um, because I've been seeing this, this idea around a lot. Um, I mean, even, you know, in The Matrix, for example, Agent Smith sits down with Morpheus and says, every mammal on this planet adjusts to its environment and finds some kind of equilibrium, but you don't. You just move into an area and you consume and consume and the only way you can maintain yourself is by spreading to a new area like a virus and things like extinction rebellion are kind of bringing awareness of the ecocidal nature of our civilization to more and more people um i think a lot of more and more people are starting to get the dark without getting the optimism <laughs> and um and very often there is just this 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 self-loathing that comes from you know well this is just what humanity is we're just this terrible cancer on the planet uh, and really the essence of my piece is to say that that's probably a fair critique of, of this culture. Yes. But it's not a fair critique of humanity. And, um, you know, there are far older cultures than ours that have lived for tens of thousands of years without annihilating everything around them. And there's nothing about being human that means that we have to follow the values that lead to this culture of devastation and death. And I think I mean, that's probably a sort of epitome of dark optimism in a way. It's like, we need to acknowledge like how, how wrong we're going. Um, but I always try, there's, um, there's a line I love so much that I've actually got it uh, quoted permanently on the, on the top of my website, which is from Raymond Williams, who said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer in that. And so, yeah, that's one of the, conversations I'm quite actively involved in at the moment. I think resilience.org have got that piece up on their front page at the moment. So it's getting quite a lot of, lot of traffic and discussion and, and leading quite directly into um, one of the great schisms I think that there is between people who think about this stuff, which is between a, a kind of deterministic view that you know our path is set by our nature or our genetics or the inherent what it is to be human and you know the environmental conditions and on the other hand people who like myself probably are more arguing well we have choice you know we can actually see what's happening and make decisions and um and cultural evolution can happen a great deal faster than genetic evolution mm -hmm. um so uh so yeah that's 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 one conversation that's quite active for me at the moment yeah that's great well that's one of the things that i've appreciated about your work um is that you find a way, as is my nature, to um, bridge uh, seemingly divergent perspectives that are actually in agreement on probably 80 to 90 percent. I mean, I saw you recently did that with uh, respect to uh, Jeremy Lent and, uh, and Jim Bendel um, and what you're now speaking. And then, and then there was a piece that you referred me to uh, when we were in the process of scheduling this call. Say, yeah, say, the, the, the secret truth behind environmentalists' favorite argument. Mm. Yes, yes. Say something about that, because I thought that was really excellent. And, and the listeners of this podcast series, I think, would greatly value from that. Okay, well, actually, that was a piece I wrote maybe... That was 2013, as I recall. Right, right. Yeah, quite a while back. Um, but it's one that seems to periodically get rediscovered and do the rounds again. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, basically it was, it was, um, I suppose me grappling with, with the darkness of our situation myself and kind of getting, getting a bit frustrated that I constantly be hearing this same argument between environmentalists in whatever context, um, which would be on the one hand, people saying, um, you know, we need radical change. We need revolution because otherwise we're just addressing the symptoms and we're not really getting to the root causes. And I think, yeah, okay, fair enough. And then on the other hand, you'd have someone arguing saying, we don't have time to wait for radical change or revolution. You know, everything's so urgent. We've got to just act with the frameworks that we've got now. And I sort of think, yeah, fair enough. And th these arguments would get really, really tiring because both sides have a point. <laughs> and, and they'd both be kind of arguing back and forth, back and forth, you know, all night long or all, all career long. 
and the, the reason I think that those arguments were never resolved is because they're both right. Yes, like, exactly. we, we do need radical change and there probably isn't time for radical change. Um, and so the question for me, the interesting question is, well, what then? Um, you know, what if both of those things are true? Where does that leave us? And I think very often, I mean, this is where I was quite involved with Dark Mountain from the early days as well. And this is where that whole thing comes in. I think Dark Mountain creates a space where we can at least ask those questions. Like, what if it's too late to achieve the thing that we thought we were trying to achieve? And what if what we're hoping for is in fact anti-future? I mean, I see hope not as neutral, that there are things that we can put our hope in that lead us to continue living in a overshoot uh, prone and, uh, and uh, life destroying manner. And there are hopes that we can have that can lead us to live in a downshifted, downscaled, uh, more local and community uh, uh, ecologically wise manner. And so hope is kind of like, I've said this in some other interviews, hope is like liquid. It's like, do you have hope? Do you have hope? Do you have liquid? Well, some liquids will sustain you, some liquids will kill you. So it's what we have hope in. And I think if our hope isn't grounded in ecological reality, um, and human understanding of, of cultures. This is why I so appreciate your work in furthering David Fleming's um, uh, uh, profound understanding of human cultural thrive, the difference between cultures that thrive and cultures that self-destruct. Mm-hmm. I want to come back also to, to one thing that you mentioned earlier, which is, you know, this idea that some people have that just we're just inherently self-destructive, we're inherently terrible, you know, we're a virus with boots or whatever virus with shoes. Um, I call that, I, I come to think of that, I come out of a conservative Christian background. I was raised Catholic, but then for about five years, I was very Pentecostal, evangelical, Bible-believing, you know, anti-evolution. And, and then, you know, in the early 80s, kept broadening beyond that to embrace Native American spirituality and, and uh, or other earth-honoring forms of uh, religiosity and Buddhism and elsewhere. But there's a phenomenon that was very common in biblical scholarship, which is that scholars look down a, uh, a well and see their own reflection. So they're looking back in time, but then they see their own reflection, a, a judging humanity, for example. Uh, in this case, in that case, it was like seeing Jesus as a reflection of who we are today and what we think would be ideal uh, rather than the actual Jesus of history. Well, now I apply that to humanity. One of the things I love about Edward Goldsmith, Teddy Goldsmith's work, uh, The Way and an and, uh, and Ecological Worldview and others. In fact, anybody who's listening to this conversation, um, if you're not familiar with uh, William Catton and his book Overshoot um, and Teddy Goldsmith and his book The Way, I, I highly recommend them. But, you know, Goldsmith made a half a career in showing the difference between sustainable cultures for the first 90, 97 to 98 percent of human history living more or less in a way that didn't defile and destroy everything they depended upon. In other words, relating to the ecosphere or the biosphere is a greater thou rather than a lesser it. And um, certainly industrial culture and other human-centered anthropocentric rather than ecocentric cultures, which destroy their own base by, by definition. That's what, that's practically the guaranteed thing once you shift out of ecocentrism to human-centered anthropocentrism. Um, and so I, I appreciated you bringing that up because I, I find that many people just assume that our species in, is incapable of living sustainably, incapable of living in a non-self-destructive way, in a, in a pro-future way, like other animals. And when you realize that, no, for you know, 97% of our history, for like 40,000 generations or more, we've lived more or less that. And ultimately, religion, it turns out, or life ways is the way Teddy Goldsmith talked about it, but life ways is that element of society. Society, that aspect of the, the moral voice of society that ensures that limits are honored upon pain of death or being ostracized, that their limits are sacred. Um, so I don't know whether you know this, but uh, Teddy Goldsmith and David Fleming were great friends. Um, I, I've, I had heard that, yes. Yeah, and, uh, and I think Teddy was, was a big supporter of David in his early days as a writer and helping him kind of get established through The Ecologist, which I'm fully aware of, and the like. Um, but yeah, what you were saying about uh, the sort of deeper time perspective, looking looking for a perspective that is not just taking today. I mean, I think part of the problem is that people see actually evolution as a linear thing. 
right that, you know that it started off with sort of something primordial and has gone on this in, in, inevitable journey to the pinnacle of us right um whereas evolution isn't directional in that way you know sometimes it goes down dead end sometimes it backs up sometimes all kinds of things happen so right. but because that that idea has been embedded partly by that famous image of you know the ape and then the upright ape and then the human right. it gives this right. sense of um where and and so we look at today and if you assume that all of history inevitably led to today then you can sort of think well human nature is to end up where we are now whereas if you see evolution as just a process that's exploring all kinds of pathways some of which are good and some of which are not going to work so well then you might just as well take any historical perspective throughout history and that's where we're coming from where you're saying well you know if you'd happen to look at humanity 10,000 years ago, there'd be no way that you'd be saying, well, this is inevitably going to destroy everything around it because that wasn't what we were doing then. Right, right. Um, and, uh, and this actually ties in, I think, a lot with what we were starting to talk about around hope. Um, because for me, the, it's, it's not just what we place our hope in, it's the sort of, there's something about the kind of hope that we have as well. Um, there's something around... <sighs> There's something around the kind of emotion of um, how we confront things. So, you know, there's, as I was saying, there's something very difficult about acknowledging, well, what if we need radical change and there isn't time for radical change? There's something emotionally that makes us not want to ask that question and find it more comfortable to just kind of go round and round in circles with each other. Um, and I think that something is, is very related to grief, actually. Yes. Um, it's actually, it, it, it hurts to let go of the stories that we've been told about what makes sense as a as a life path and to accept yes. that the stories that we were raised in most of us are don't lead where they said they were going to lead <laughs> they don't they don't lead to star trek um they lead to the annihilation of life on earth and the space between stories is one of the most awkward and painful places because you don't have anything to make sense of life with yeah and it's it's quite um an emotional challenge to sit in that space and um as we discussed very briefly by email i i sort of came to an understanding of this to some extent through david fleming's very sudden death and then my late fiance who suddenly died just three weeks after david very suddenly died and that was an experience of, I mean, you know, David was a mentor who was really helping me to figure out how to build a life around these kind of interests and passions outside of the mainstream framework. Mm -hmm. And so when he died, it really was like my entire sort of work career world sort of disappeared and my entire sort of romantic personal life world disappeared. And I found myself in a very, personal way in a space between stories you know so so your fiance died suddenly only three or four weeks after david uh, died in 2010 is that right that's right yeah oh my gosh i can't even imagine well so that's the thing is it it, it you know on a really you know personal visceral unavoidable way the stories i'd been telling myself about kind of progress in my own life Right. Um, sort of evaporated in the space of a, a month. And, and so I found myself thrust into that, that kind of space between stories. And initially, I, I didn't really care about very much at all. I just sort of shut down, which I think is what you do when, of course. when something hurts that much. Um, and then a, a really close friend of mine, I mean, a lot of people say a lot of things to you when you're grieving that just get a bit annoying, like condolences is a word that I just hate. It's like a word to, for, for that when you don't know what to say here's a word to put in that gap you know um but i had a friend who said something that well it changed my life um she said to me that the best way to honor those you love after they die is to keep alive what was best in them in the world through your own life yes and at that point that was all i cared about like that no. was the only thing that contained any spark of motivation for me was if I can honor them in some way, yes. then that's actually worth getting out of bed for. Yeah. 
and in David's case, well, <laughs> so we worked really closely together for the um, five years or so between meeting and, and his death. But the one thing he never let me look at was Lean Logic. Um, <laughs> Uh, we worked really closely on everything else, but he said we were too close and um, if I, it was too close to his heart and if I looked at it and didn't like it, we'd fall out basically and he didn't want us to fall out. Right. Um, but after his death, he didn't really have close families. So um, I was involved with sort of going through his possessions and sorting them out and getting the house ready to be sold and that kind of stuff. And I found the manuscript for his book and I figured, you know, I'm allowed to read it at this point. Um, and it, you know, as you know, it's it's incredible. And I, I, so it was very obvious to me very quickly that the, the way I could best honour him and keep what was most beautiful in him alive in the world was by, by seeing his books published. Um, but I really want to just, without getting into the nitty gritty of that, it's it's that fundamental thing about the, the kind of hope, mm -hmm. because at that point there wasn't any point anymore in hoping that these people would come back to life. You know, that's, that's, that hope is gone. Like, I don't have any means of even working towards that. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think a lot of my writing around that time, um, probably including that piece you mentioned for 2013, started drawing the parallels between that sort of loss of hope and the kind of loss of hope of, you know, just, sustainability as it's you know usually sold to us that we're just kind of somehow switch to renewable energies and carry on as we are and that that's that's a good thing and all of that like the death of my hope in those relationships somehow paralleled the death of the hope in the paths that were sold to us for sustainability yeah. but then i discovered the hope beyond hope as some people call it um you know with regard to the world i remember writing in that piece you mentioned you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm living in a dying world. And it's actually, it's the same dying world I lived in yesterday, but today I see it for what it is. And then the question of what now somehow is, is, is actually lighter and freer because before I was spending so much energy on denying my actual predictions on what was unfolding, my actual beliefs about what was happening. And I kept, no, we must keep hope. You know, we must stay positive. We must, but I didn't really believe it. And so it was exhausting to continually be, you know, trying to find hope. So when I could actually accept, okay, I don't think I can change this. I think, you know, we're headed into a collapse scenario. We're headed into um, what David calls the climacteric, this, you know, coming together of all these intertwined crises once you step beyond that threshold and actually accept that actually a huge amount of energy is liberated yes a amount of energy and that that hope beyond hope is actually stronger than the original hope because it's no longer really attached to outcomes it's just about telling a story with our lives that we're proud to tell in the context that we find ourselves and you know the the kind of the default hope the the must stay positive hope it's kind of fragile because it's constantly being threatened by information that maybe maybe our hope is misplaced. Yes. But that hope beyond hope, there's nothing can challenge it. Like, you know, no matter what kind of future we face, no matter how wrong I inevitably am about how the future is going to unfold, I want to tell a story with my life that I'm deeply proud to tell. Mm. And nothing can make me doubt that. And it was the same on the personal level. Like once I started working for their legacy and in Maria's case, my, my late fiance, um, she was from Pakistan and with her family, we opened an orphanage there in her memory because she was always very moved by, um, by the plight of, of orphans in her home country. And so doing this work to honor them is just right <laughs> you know i just know it's the story i want to tell with my life and there's no information that could come to light that could make me think oh god what a waste of time it was publishing that book or yeah. you know creating that organization and that is so powerful because in these times where so much of the news is is bleak and awful if we can have a motivation that's that's that deep that that's that's that unchallenging that's that implacable that is so, so important and so valuable. And it even, um, 
I think it even has something really important to offer people in, in deep despair, because if despair is looking at every possible outcome and thinking that they're all awful, so what's the point in doing anything? Then as soon as you see the glimpse of one possibility and that whole despair is transformed into massive motivation, yes. you, nobody wants to be in despair. Um, and so again, you get this, this huge surge of a, a deep, resilient motivation to act in ways that make sense to you, which are not dependent on circumstances. And once you have that, then, you know, I mean, a few years ago, I had a, a quite a deep burnout experience because of this sense of, oh my God, everything's falling apart and there's so much to do. And, but again, once you're coming from that deeper place of actually, what story do I want to tell with my life? then that's not exhausting. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a delight to, to actually live the way you want to live. Um, and that's, I think, been my biggest learning over the last couple of years is to be doing my work from a place of joy, actually. Um, and to, to, to have that as my, my guiding star, um, that actually if I'm, if I'm feeling uh, drained and exhausted, and then, I'm, then I've lost my way. Um, and actually joy is exactly the guidance that's needed for making sense of which path to take in that hope beyond hope. And it's, it's not just, you know, oh, well, I enjoy this, so I'll do this. It's a much deeper, more reflective, you know, taking in all the information that I have, listening to the little voice that's whispering to me that maybe this isn't quite the right path for me anymore. But taking account of all of that information, then listening to joy is such a such a guide yeah wow i am so grateful that you just shared all that and the way that you did it because the last six or seven minutes of what you shared pretty much encapsulates what connie and i are meaning by post doom consciousness uh yeah. you know w those of us that were born in the 1940s 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s um we grew well maybe not 90s but we grew we, we were raised in a culture of expectations of more and more um yeah. and then at some point we began to realize that that's not aligned with reality we're now looking at contraction we're looking at collapse just as other previous civilizations have collapsed and that can be a doom emotionally speaking that can be a doom like experience and for many people it is. Um, I mean, there are some people who have known, like John Michael Greer, of the rise and fall of civilizations, and so he doesn't feel it, it you know, as doom as all, at all. It's just, this is what happens, this is reality. But for most of us, emotionally, we avoid that door of doom because we are terrified that that's the end point, that we yeah. then wallow in despair. And I've come to see it as doom is the midpoint between denial and death or even extinction and the midpoint is doom and yes above the door is w a s f we are so fucked and that's what keeps us from avoiding that door that we go through the stages many of us go through the stages of grief and that sort of thing but as paul Chaperka talks about coming to that place beyond acceptance of finding the gift allows us to go through that door and then all the spiritual traditions or virtually all the spiritual traditions align in that if you allow yourself to go through that despair, that door, and then turn around and look at the, at the, at the banner again above the sign, it still says W-A-S-F, but it's now interpreted as we are so fortunate to be alive at this time and to be able to make the difference that we can. And then I see these spheres of gratitude moving out until ultimately our own death and or our species extinction and both are inevitable it's just a matter of time and so what you just articulated was a fabulous um uh, encapsulation of that and i and I, I guess i want to lead this have this lead into a little more on language because your language of dark optimism um, the terms that I've used for myself as a sacred realist, a religious naturalist, but around this doom stuff, around this climate and overshoot and all these other things, um, I've found the language of dark optimism, apocaloptimism, you know, that I got from uh, Theo uh, uh, Kitchener uh, in Australia, um, uh, and now post doom as ways of getting to uh, lang in language. So I'm curious. Um, what language do you find useful uh, or helpful uh, in uh, describing this uh, contracting and deteriorating future? Some have used civilizational reboot or catabolic collapse, population die off, 
uh, mm. the, ex the extinction of Homo Colossus is William Catton's term, sixth grade extinction, et cetera. Like what language? And then, and then say a little bit more about what dark optimism means to you and how you interpret post doom. Huh. Nice, easy question, huh? Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, I guess when David Fleming and I were having those glorious conversations we used to have, uh, we used to use his term, which is the climacteric, because um, he, he draws the analogy to stages in the life of a, of a person uh, and in sort of old, to some extent still, but certainly in older medical traditions, so there's this idea that every, every 14 years and every seven years was a significant point and significant things would happen at that climacteric moment. Uh, so that was his term for the converging thing. I've always rather liked um, James Howard Kunstler's rather impolite term, the, uh, the great global clusterfuck seems to encapsulate, <laughs> encapsulate something of it rather well. Um, in a sense, I think that's only half of it. You know, the, the, the extent to which we're fucked is one half of the story. The other half of the story is, uh, there's a line from a, a poem I love, the Ziderata, um, whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Mm -hmm. And and I think both of those are really essential. The, yeah. the awareness that, you know, clearly, um, <laughs> I think there's an old Irish joke, which is, um, oh, you're, you're trying to find your way to Killarney. Oh, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, if we're, if we're looking to go towards the, uh, you know, the great cultural turning towards sanity and resilience and beauty, then, you know, things could be going a lot better than they are. And, and the great global cost of captures that really beautifully. But at the same time, it, as you say, when, once you go through that door, I mean, I would even personally be of the opinion that I chose to be alive at this particular moment in history. Um, and I mean, in some ways, that's why joy is such a great guide, because, you know, I talked about shutting down so completely after those, those intimate deaths in my life. And that was necessary to sustain myself, but it's not a nice place to be, to be completely shut down and numb and, and, and feeling nothing of any significance at all. And of course, so then you start thinking, well, how do I come back to life? And the way back to life is through, as you say, it's, it's opening all those doors inside yourself that you slammed shut. And behind yeah. every door is this wall of pain, because that's why you slammed it shut. Yeah. But at the same time, opening those doors is, I mean, that's what grieving is. It's going through that pain to come back to life. And, um, and so, yeah, dark optimism is, for me, you know, bright, shiny optimism just annoy, it annoys me because, you know, everything isn't fine. <laughs> you know, everything really isn't fine. You're just not paying attention. But at the same time, you know, the darkness is real. It's there. Everything isn't how we want it to be. But the optimism is that we can still tell beautiful stories with our lives in this time. We can still tell beautiful stories with our culture in this time. I have a friend who says you cannot not change the world. Like, whatever you do changes the world. Like, if you if you follow the most default down the line, do what they tell you pathway, then that's the world that you're helping to create. So the question is, what kind of story do we want to tell? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I guess dark optimism at the deepest level is about the balance between the genuine darkness of what's unfolding and the suffering and all the awfulness of that. And the awareness that um, at the deepest level, you start asking questions about, you know, what's life for, what's life about? Yes. Um, and at that level, there's nothing about these times that stops us living meaningful, beautiful lives just as much as any people have throughout yeah. history. Um, I suppose the only other, yeah, you were asking about language, the only other way that I sometimes think of it now, because another thing that really annoys me is when people um, think of the apocalypse as an event. Um, and uh, Paul Kingsnorth, who's a friend of mine, often has this lovely line about uh, history is just a history of apocalypses. You know, if you were a Native American, you've lived through the apocalypse. If you were an Anglo-Saxon, you've lived through the apocalypse. If you were, if you were in Kashmir right now, you're living through the apocalypse. Like, and there's um, science fiction will, writer William Gibson said, um, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, uh, that to me is, is so profound because people are still in this sort of, shrinking circle of affluence. I mean, I think for most of the world, the apocalypse has already happened. 
and people inside this shrinking circle of affluence are still saying, well, where's your apocalypse then? You know, everything's fine as far as I can see. Uh, yeah. And um, and so I find that quite useful language, this kind of shrinking circle within which people still have the ability to sit around and pretend like everything's fine. Um, when, yeah, for most of the world, it it really isn't. And I, I would extend that far beyond the human world as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when we're counting deaths, not just in thousands or millions, but in actual species, yes. you know, yes. the, the death of birth, you know, that, that there will never again be those life forms born. I mean, yeah, everything really isn't fine. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, I mean, I, the, just that, first of all, I love the fact that you keep coming back to the story that we're telling of our lives. I, I greatly appreciate that languaging. Um, for anybody listening to this conversation, you've mentioned Dark Mountain, you mentioned Paul Kingsnorth, and uh, anybody listening to this, read the Dark Mountain Manifesto, read some of the other things there. It's just absolutely fabulous. Dougal is going to be a part of this series. Paul, I totally honor his saying, you know, looks great, Michael, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm staying focused for the next six months or longer. So I'll reach out to him again in six months. Yeah. Um, but um, that emphasis on the narratives that we tell, the stories that the, the dysfunctional or, or, dis, or functional stories that we tell both with our lives and that we rehearse as our narratives of reality um, make a profound difference. Uh, one of the things that my own work is trying to do now is reframe some of these cultural stories, including the Christian story, in mm -hmm. ways that are inescapably real, having to do with violating grace limits, for example, the grace limits of primary reality, that that's what the fall is all about. It's not about our great-great-grandmother eating an apple. It's when we dishonor the grace limits of primary reality, we take ourselves out of paradise and put ourselves on a path of self-destruction. And when I speak in Christian context, I say we can't save ourselves. Only as the indigenous folks have, those who are still living in the garden, that is, those who are still living in an intimate relationship with the larger family, the body of life, is that by making the future their primary guiding principle in the present. So, you know, this idea of allowing the seventh generation to determine or to help to determine how we act in the present isn't just a good idea to do otherwise is evil. So when I speak in Christian context, I say it's only by making the future our Lord, that by making the future the guiding principle of our lives and that whatever the Trinity means in theological language, the creator is the past personified, deified. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the redeemer, the savior, the Messiah is the future personified. Um, deified and the Holy Spirit, as the Hebrews spoke about it, the wind and the breath, which you can only experience in the present moment. So the present moment deified. And so for me, having a sacred relationship to past, future, and present, because the only place we can be a blessing or a curse to the future is in the present moment. So um, at any rate. I, well, on, on that, um, I mean, I, yeah, I love that, <laughs> actually. But there's, there's one, um, one little element of it that that i don't know maybe it's the grit that makes the pearl i don't know but uh, that that kind of didn't quite sit right uh, or, or or could not quite sit right which is that i think one of the um one of the great shortcomings of i don't know environmentalism for want of a better word um in the broadest sense has been that it's become so preachy you know it's so much about should it's so much like this is wrong and you shouldn't do that and rah, rah. and I've been thinking a lot about you know how could we get beyond that sense you know the, the environmentalists are classically characterized as tedious killjoys who wouldn't know how to enjoy ourselves in a vegan chocolate factory and how how to get beyond that sort of um that experience that people have of kind of oscillating between guilt and self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's with regard to jet flights or eating meat or, you know, whatever it may be, um, there's this tendency to either be on the side of, God, I really shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it anyway and I feel terrible about it, or, oh, I'm not doing this, but I really wish I was because <laughs> I really miss it. And I'm judging others who are doing it. Exactly, right. And it kind of invites that. And so I, th I think the the um golden path that lead that, that 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 works that isn't either of those is is integration actually is to allow the two voices in ourselves to talk to each other 
So the part of us that wants to take that flight and the part of us that doesn't want the consequences of taking that flight, let them have a conversation. And to many people's surprise, in my experience, they actually quite quickly come to agreement. Yeah. Um, and then you can take that agreement forward wholeheartedly. So you can either say, well, actually, I mean, in my case, the one thing in the world I would most love to see is the great redwoods of California. And I had an opportunity um, several years ago, I was seeing a girl from California. She really wanted me to come out and meet her folks out there. It would have been, and it was just around the time, this is sort of 2000, 2002, I think, um, where I was really starting to understand the climate impacts of flying and all of that. And I, I reflected on this and I thought, you know, I wouldn't feel right about flying to see these great life forms and in so doing contribute to their death. Yes, exactly. Like that, that actually isn't the story I want to tell with my life. And because I took the time to reflect on that and integrate that, I don't in any way see that as a sacrifice, despite the fact that if I could magically teleport myself anywhere in the world, it would be there. Because going there would have made me unhappy. It would have brought that cognitive dissonance and that, that challenge in myself that I would have been, well, I'm not telling the story I want to tell. So choosing not to fly was just choosing to be happier. Yeah. And I think if, if that's integrated into that story, if, 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 you know, if we're choosing the future because, because it's the story we want to tell, not because Michael said we should, because it's the good thing, you know? Yes, um, no, exactly. That's, that's, that's the danger of the good and evil language is it, it can get tied up so much with this sense of, I'm being told what to do rather than I'm finding the truth in myself and acting wholeheartedly. Yes. Uh, I'm really grateful. First of all, I'm a, a complete alignment with what you just shared. And the way that I see it is that without, without a larger sense of self, a self with that's identified with time and space, um, then we get into some of these quandaries. Um, whereas when a, we know that we are nature becoming aware of itself, that we are part of the body of life, not its masters. Um, and that when we, when we recognize that the past lives in us, literally, and whatever future exists is also, we contribute to that. So that sense of obligation or, or, or reciprocity, that sacred relationship to time and to nature is what uh, Joanna Macy said it really well. Uh, I'm so grateful that she'll be part of this series because she's a major mentor of many of us. Um, and she said years ago, a quote um, that I used to use in my programs, she said, this shift, the shift from seeing ourselves as separate creatures placed on earth, walking around in a universe to seeing ourselves as a mode of being of earth, an expression of the universe, she said, this shift is essential to our survival because it can serve in lieu of morality and because moralizing is so ineffective. She says, sermons seldom hinder us from pursuing our self-interest. You know, I, it would never occur to me to say, Sean, don't cut off your leg. No, no, really don't cut off your leg because your leg's a part of you and you know it. Yeah. Joanna says, so are the trees in the Amazon basin. There are external lungs. And that's what we're waking up to is that we are our world. And what we do to our world, we do to ourself. There's that sense of our larger self. So I, I so appreciate you for, you know, calling me on that. I do see pro-future as good, godly, divine, and pro-future policies and actions as that. Um, and I do see that there's a role in, certainly in traditional societies, there was always a role of calling that which destroys the community, that which destroys the body of life, that which is destructive, especially if it if it, it positively influences the individual or group of individuals and yet is destructive of the larger community upon or the future, then I, I do see evil language as appropriate or whatever condemnatory language. Um, but I think ultimately, individually, my sense of how I live my life comes out of joy. Arnie Ness, one of the founders of, of, uh, of Deep Ecology, um, you know, spoke that he said environmentalism is a treacherous or responsibility is a treacherous basis for conservation. It's got to come from love. So um, you already started sharing this, but I want to come back to because really the heart of this uh, particular podcast series um, is people, you know, rather than people sort of sharing their, their talking points as they do in their lectures and talks, whatever, which is all great stuff. I've been amazed at the quality of the 
folks that have been interested in having this conversation, but also really to provide a space for people to share their, their personal journey. How did you come to, again, you shared some of it in terms of the sudden death of, of uh, both David and your fiance, but um, when did it begin to shift for you? When did you come to the awareness that um, perpetual progress was a myth? Was it gradual, sudden? And what was that like emotionally? So uh, share, uh, share a little bit of your, your trajectory, your life story, or your journey in terms of coming to grips with all this. 